On today's episode of the podcast, I'm sharing a couple recent knitting failures, some knitting progress that I have finally made towards the KT Cal, a really fantastic book that I'm reading, one that I want to read, and a hand lotion that I swear by for those of us that don't want greasy hands when we're knitting. So get cozy and let's dive in. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Wool Needles Hands Knitting Podcast. My name is Taylor, and I will be your host. Today's episode is going to be a little on the light side in regards to knitting, because due to a couple of frustrating, well, I wouldn't say that both of them are failures. I actually wouldn't even call either of them failures, really, but due to some frustrating back pedaling in some knitting projects, I haven't really got a lot done because I think I got a little bit tired <laughs> of the situation and I needed to regroup. And I wanna to talk to you about that today. But because we're kind of light on knitting content and because I have recently got onto a 30 minute a day reading kick um, because I'm setting some personal goals for reading, I have a really great book recommendation for you. Plus, which I've talked a little bit about, but I'm almost finished. I think I'm like 92% of the way through the book. And then I have a couple other books I'm really excited to crack into. And I know so many of you are avid readers. And so I figured I would share some of that with you. And then not long ago, I was asked a question from a viewer over on the tip line about my favorite hand cream um, to use when you're knitting so that you don't have overly greasy hands but you keep your hands moisturized and so I figured I do have my favorite it's one I swear by and so I want to give you guys that recommendation as well so all of this today on what is rather a smorgasbord is that how you pronounce that of a knitting episode so let's go ahead and dive into it I just recently shared with you an episode about archiving your works in progress. And when I did that episode, um, I didn't have a lot of works in progress going and I, I archived most of them. So I only have two active projects right now. Actually, really, to be honest, one that has been in the forefront and the other that is really on the back burner right now, but I'm still considering it active because once I get my feet, you know, my, the ball rolling on this project, I'll be able to go back and forth. Um, but the one that I've been really focusing my attention on most is the one that I'm knitting right now for the KT Cal, which is a knit along that I'm hosting here on the channel that is happening over on the Patreon. That's where a lot of the information is disseminated and all of that. And that's for all members of Patreon, those that do provide a monthly donation and those that do not, that just are there to support um, with their presence. And so if you would like to get involved in this knit along, definitely head over to Patreon, check it out and see if that knit along is right for you. But that's what my project is kind of based on right now. It is where we are working together to navigate the Karen Templar, how to improvise a top-down sweater blog tutorial series to create our own improvised, modified for just us, top-down sweater. Now, when I first embarked on this journey, you may remember if you've been watching for a while, I thought that I was going to make a cardigan. That was, that was what I was thinking. And I was going to make the cardigan with this yarn here. This is Debbie Bliss, uh, Donegal Aaron Tweed. And it's a beautiful yarn. And this was kind of the beginning of that like project. But as I was working it, I was realizing, or at least I think I was realizing that I was not, with the instructions provided in the tutorial, I was not going to be able to get the V of the sweater to where I wanted it to have this boyfriend style V-neck sweater look. I really love a deep V-neck cardigan. Um, I, I, I Not just any V-neck cardigan, it really does have to be that deep V-neck cardigan that has kind of like, um, pardon the expression, but like, you know, the boyfriend or a grandpa style cardigan if you can kind of visualize what I mean. So I started to work on this. I realized that based on the instructions, it was just kind of vague and I was really going to have to be doing a lot of kind of like legwork to figure out exactly how to turn this into the proper V-neck cardigan for what I was going for. And I just didn't, excuse me, I just wasn't up for that challenge. Um, I didn't want to do that. And, and I really discovered how much I didn't want to do that when I discovered um, Florence Miller's recent design that she came out with called the Step by Step Cardigan. She has a whole video tutorial series on knitting this cardigan. And when I saw the photo of the cardigan, I realized that is exactly what I'm going for. It has this really deep v-neck, nice button band, the whole shape of the cardigan, even down to the yarn she chose, which is gorgeous. 
and I loved it. And I thought to myself, like, I really could sit here and work through improvising my own v-neck cardigan, but she's done this. She has a pattern. She has a YouTube tutorial. It's using a similar weight of yarn in, in kind of a similar aesthetic, if you will, and it's all there. And so I, desi I decided, my nose is really itchy right now, and so I decided that I was going to save this yarn and this cardigan project for that pattern because it's already there. I don't want to reinvent the wheel right now in regards to that. So this came off the needles and I decided I was going to move in a different direction, which I did. And I got really excited about this yarn that I had recently purchased and added to my stash that I picked up at Joanne called, it's the, the Knit and Crochet brand, which is I think under the Joanne kind of brand, if you will. Knit and Crochet 100% cotton DK weight yarn. It is gorgeous. It's very much more cobalt blue on the screen. I don't know what it is. My camera saturation level is just probably off, but this yarn is not quite as blue as you're seeing it. I'll pop a picture up so you can see the true color, but I loved this. I loved the texture of the cotton. I loved the color. I loved the weight. And I thought, hey, why not knit myself a top-down raglan sweatshirt inspired sweater with this yarn? And I don't know where all of my background knowledge and understanding of fiber content went. It must have flown completely out the window because you have a lot to take into consideration when you're planning on using 100% cotton yarn. It's not elastic. It's not resilient. It's lovely to work with. I really love knitting with cotton yarn. Um, it feels nice in the hand. It's breathable, all of that but it doesn't have any of those resilient qualities that we look for in a you know protein fiber or wool or something like that. And and that's a big deal, especially when you're trying to knit something that has a nice crew neck with a little bit of structure, um, something that's going to have maybe structure around the, cu the cuffs, around the waistband, and that you really want to kind of stay where it is once you knit it. You don't want it to grow a lot um, or stretch out too much. And cotton really does have this tendency to, once you've stretched it, it doesn't really come back, okay? So for example, socks knit in cotton. It's really dicey because when you pull a sock up over your foot, you're going to need to stretch it around certain areas of that foot, but you're going to want that to then come back to its original uh, position and size. Cotton doesn't do that. It just kind of stays where you stretch it. But here I am. I decided I was going to knit this sweatshirt shirt inspired, inspired garment in this yarn. And everything was working out fine. You know, getting the, and, and this whole tutorial series has you working a staggered start neckline. That means you're not doing short rows to shape the back of the neck. You're actually casting on a crescent of stitches, marking your sleeve raglans, your front and back raglans, your sleeves and all of this. And then you're adding stitches to create the shape of the neck. Well, all the way up until about, I don't know, maybe four or five inches of work down, that was three and a half inches of work down the back, I decided to go ahead and add the neckline to this sweater. And as I was adding the neckline to this sweater, so I'll pop it up so you can see the two by two rib neckline. As I was adding the neckline, and, and this is not the first one, okay, so the first time I added a neckline to this, I dropped down like three needle sizes. I wanted a really nice, crispy, you know, one by one rib neckline, um, knit the one by one rib neckline, made it to the end of the neckline, decided to do an Italian bind off because that's, you know, a nice looking bind off, but something else it's known for is being quite stretchy and flexible. So I, I did an Italian bind off the first time around and it was a disaster. The Italian bind off, though it looked nice, it was ripply and, and stretched and it didn't have any shape and there was no structure. I mean, uh, of course, because this is 100% cotton yarn, I really, I honestly, I don't know where the disconnect is. So then I ripped out that. And I started another one and it was another one by one, but it was with a little bit of a larger needle and I, um, and I didn't do the Italian bind off that time. Same problem in that the edge was ripply, but also the cast on ed or the bind off edge was not elastic at all. I couldn't even fit my head in there. Okay. So then I changed again, same needle, same, um, same two by two essentially. But then when I got to the, and this is here, when I got to the bind off edge, I bound off on a larger needle. And that's where we are now. 
and I finished binding off, tried to fit it over my head and it didn't fit over my head. And it, I would have had to stretch it to get it over my head. And once I had done that, it would have stretched it to a point where when it was sitting on my neck, it would have that like bacon collar look. It was really just really bad. And then as if to kind of pour salt in the wound and the universe's way of telling me like, yeah, this is a bad idea if you didn't already realize it, Taylor. As I was kind of backing out of this, this situation happened here. I. I don't even know what's happening here. Honestly, it's something got snagged or there, there's no drop stitch here, you guys. Even as much as it looks like it is, it's not. And it was just kind of like this whole choice that I made because this was a choice. This whole choice that I made was right there just telling me like, stop, you're embarrassing yourself. You're acting like a complete rookie. What is this that you're doing? Yada, yada, yada. And it was bad. And so then I realized this was not going to work and I needed to kind of rethink my situation. And I literally, I haven't even taken this off the needles yet. I just kind of put it off to the side. I was so over it. Um, and I was even more frustrated too because I have this cotton sweater in my wardrobe. It's just a sweater from Madewell. It's 100% cotton. It is knit. It is heavy, like nobody's business because cotton tends to be heavy. And, and it fits nicely. Okay, it's stretchy. There's no elastane in this at all. There's no spandex, nothing to give it any elastic, you know, properties, but yet it does. And that's partly because the sweater has this really interesting fisherman's rib situation going on. But even the neckline, you see how nice and structured that gorgeous folded over crew neckline is? It's beautiful. I love it. And it has a stretchiness to it. I wear, I've worn this sucker so many times and it doesn't, it's not out of, you know, it hasn't fallen out of shape. I don't know what it is. And so I decided, obviously I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do a little bit more research, look up some patterns that use cotton to create a garment and figure out what's happening here. Under what conditions and circumstances do you want to use cotton yarn to knit a garment? Um, I wanna know more about that. And I just thought, I guess I just don't know as much as I thought, but I do know enough to know that you don't knit things that require structure and resilience out of 100% cotton yarn. You just don't. And that's that was a lesson learned. So um, after I did that, I went back to my stash because I was really hoping to just use yarn that I had in my stash. I purchased enough yarn, that Deb, Debbie Bliss yarn I purchased, this blue yarn I purchased. I'm not buying any more yarn. It's, I'm just not going to do it because there's yarn in my stash. I dye yarn for a living. There's options, okay? Um, and so I went into my stash and I found this yarn here. Pardon me, it's a little noisy. This is Peyton's Classic Wool Worsted. It is my favorite budget worsted weight yarn, uh, second only to Lion Brand Fisherman's Wool. I love this, it's fantastic. It's untreated, it's very earthy and natural feeling while still being, you know, not too scratchy. I love this. And it's in this mustard brown color. They call this mustard brown, but isn't that like the most beautiful caramel color? It's just gorgeous. And so I grabbed this because I have a decent amount of this. And I decided that this would be what I would use to make this top down raglan sweater. And it would be kind of sweatshirt inspired, if you will, right? Like that simple, kind of similar to what you see here in this sweater, minus the ribbing. Okay, but but put a little footnote under where I say minus the ribbing, just for a second. Um, that was kind of what I was thinking I would do, okay? So I made my swatch, hold it, keeping it in my roll bond notebook because it's my favorite because it has these great little sheet protectors in the back for things like swatches, especially when you have like five. Okay, so here's my swatch for this yarn on a size nine needle. Beautiful, it's been folded, so it has a crease, but isn't that lovely? Great gauge, not a little bit open, a little bit more, there's some tension there, but it's a little bit more open and drapey. It's a really nice swatch. So I did that. I got all of my information written out in my notebook here in terms of my gauge, how many stitches I'm going to need to cast on, a little sketch, an idea of the shape of the overall sweater, all of this. And then some notion decided to, you know, wander into my mind about how maybe on top of all of this, I wanted to knit my sweater in fisherman's rib because I've never done fisherman's rib before. And I thought, why not have a really lovely top down raglan 
Fisherman's Rib crew neck sweater. And so I was thinking to myself, well, that would be great. So I started swatching some Fisherman's Rib with this yarn and I don't have the swatch anymore because it's not going to happen and I'll tell you why. But I started swatching, loved the way it looked, love Fisherman's Rib. I actually really love knitting it. I've never done any kind of increases or decreases and I'm learning that that's a whole thing you really need to pay attention to because it's not the same as doing increases and decreases you know, outside of Fisherman's Ribs. So that's a whole thing. Loved the way it looked. And I thought, oh, this is great. Only to kind of have the realization come upon me that Fisherman's Rib takes on average 20% more yarn than stockinette stitch. So you're going to need a lot more yarn. I only have six balls of this, which is enough to give me the sweater if it's just a basic stockinette sweater or with minimal texture, what have you, but certainly not enough to accommodate Fisherman's Rib. So I uh, tabled that idea. That was obviously not going to happen, but for whatever reason, I had the fisherman's rib thing stuck in my head. I went back and forth with a couple other yarns in my stash, did some swatching, realized that perhaps my first foray into fisherman's rib should be with a published pattern where somebody has done a lot of that shaping and sizing work for me, kind of similar to the cardigan situation. And now we are back with this Patton's Classic Wool yarn, not fisherman's rib, Sockinette stitch. Maybe I'll throw some nice texture in there, but at least I have a jumping off point in terms of my size and my gauge. And so here we are. <laughs> what little progress I have made on this sweater for this knit along. And believe you me, I am not the only person in this knit along who has started over. Not even remotely. I don't know why I'm doing this. This isn't anything here. Um, we, it's, it almost should be called, somebody even mentioned this, we should re refer to this knit along as the start over knit along because we're all starting over at some point to kind of get our bearings and figure out what we're doing and get things right. Um, and, and there's a lot of chat about this over in the Patreon chat thread for the KT Cal and it's just a whole thing. Well, this is me over here and my start over you know, process. And this is where I am right now. And to be honest with you, even though there's not much here, I'm actually really happy that I chose to just stick with this yarn and a really lovely stockinette uh, sweater that's kind of sweatshirt inspired. Not a lot to show here in that regard, but you can see something that I really love. The raglan seam. I don't know if you can tell, but there's two stitches in the raglan seam. So it's a really nice wide raglan with knit through the front and back on either side. It's my favorite increase and de uh, increase, I should say. Um, yeah, so I'm liking the way this is going to look. I plan on giving it a really nice structured crew neck collar, probably folded over a nice tight gauge, something similar to what I have here in this, um, made well sweater here. I'm kind of going for that look like that. Some nice fitting sleeves. I don't know why I'm, I, what it's nice fitting sleeves. Okay. That's my plan. And at least now I feel like I know what I'm doing. I have confidence in the yarn and from here on out, it should be smooth sailing. And I can't keep doing this like, well, what if I did this? And what if I did this? I need to just <laughs> bring it down a notch. Okay. So that's where I am with this. That's my knitting right now. It's not a lot to speak of because I'm kind of in this, I was dealing with all of that. I mean, who wouldn't be kind of behind, but also too, because it is spring and when spring rolls around, I, I don't stop knitting, but knitting changes for me. My motivations change. The things I want to knit changes. But then also two other things come into play, you know, other other creative endeavors and things like that. But one thing that I've been thinking a lot about over the last several weeks is several two two and a half is really wanting to prioritize reading. I am not a prolific reader. However, I'm a good reader and I love reading. I love reading. I love just getting lost in a book, having a book that I'm reading. It just, it fulfills me and makes me feel at peace and I love it, but I don't do it as much as I should. And that is the same kind of way that I am about yoga. Um, yoga is so important to me. I love it. It makes me feel good. I enjoy doing it. I look forward to doing it. But for a while there, I had stopped doing it, kind of dropped the ball and, um, and it really bothered me. And so I'm kind of going through this thing right now. I figure like I turned 40, it's time to really just think about how to, and I don't mean for this to get like all 
preachy. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just kind of right now, I'm just like talking to you. Little things going through my head. But I, I feel like it's time to really think about the things that fulfill me and making sure that I am including those in my schedule as an important part of my day, even alongside of like work. And, and that's what I've been doing lately. And so I've been on this thing, um, this kick where I am reading 30 minutes a day at least. And the video that inspired me to do this was the one that I will link down below. It's called, I think it, I think it's called, I love bookstores or bookstores. Maybe it's called bookstores or bookshops. I can't remember exactly what it's called. I, I'll pop the thumbnail up here and you can see it. And then I'll link to the video down below, but it was eye opening. And it made me realize the importance of scheduling time for reading um, and doing it for at least 30 minutes a day and the vast, like I, how I could read so much more if I just did that. And so I got my Goodreads all updated. I got my books. Like, so there's a book that I had started, which I'll share with you. I started this a couple months ago, actually three months ago now. Um, I got myself in gear and I committed to reading at least 30 minutes a day to the point where I put a timer on for 30 minutes and I sit down at a time when I know I'll be uninterrupted after the kids have done their homework when there's really nothing for me at that moment to be doing. It's amazing how easy it is to find 30 minutes in your time even if you're the busiest person I promise. So I sit down 30 minutes and I read and by Jove it is amazing because I find that I read so much. Sometimes I just read more than 30 minutes because time is allowing for it and you get so lost in it. And I've made amazing progress on this book that I started reading a while ago and I'm back in my Goodreads and I'm motivated to keep track of my books. I want to start reading more books. I, um, I've been watching lots of YouTube videos about how to read more, which sounds kind of, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what that sounds like, but just, just learning about how to embrace reading and how to let go of other you know, misconceptions that you have about reading. Like for example, reading more than one book at one time. I would love to know by show of hands, how many of you read more than one book at a time? Because prior to watching a video that talked about doing this, um, and I'll link this video down below too. I love this video. This guy, I think he's like maybe 30. His name's Ali Abdal. He's a big pr productivity guru or whatever. Um, his videos are cool. He talks super fast. I know some of you think I talk fast. Like you put me times two and that's how fast this guy talks. But he was talking about books and how to read more. And he was saying that a lot of people have this preconceived notion that you can't read more than one book at a time. And I was one of those people. I, I thought the idea of reading more than one book was just not, it was not something that you did, but there's people and you may be one of them who read more than one book at a time, or they have a book that's their bedtime book and a book that's their morning coffee book, or a book that they keep at work and a book that they keep at home, or they have one nonfiction and one fiction going. And it just like, hello, that's amazing. Because or people who have audiobooks and regular books or people who read on Kindles and then they would all of this. And so I was just like, you know, it is so important to me to read more, not only for myself, but also for my children. I want them to see me reading because I want them to become readers and, and not just occasional readers. I want them to become voracious, avid readers. My parents, I grew up with parents who are just voracious readers, avid readers. And it made me want to be a reader. And, and I want to carry that over with my kids and be better about it. Yeah, so this is becoming a, a book cast right now, but I apologize. Anyway, I've been doing really well with it. I've been reading the book Ordinary Monsters by J.M. Miro. This is a book that came out in 2023. And you guys, if you are fans of Harry Potter, if you are fans of Lord of the Rings, if you are an, a fan of graphic novels like the X-Men and maybe even sprinkle in like Victorian, Edwardian just drama into all of that or if you like the whole steampunk thing. And I'm not saying that this is any one of those things, but it is this amazing amalgamation, if that's the right word, of so many of those different kinds of vibes and definitely direct influences from some of those works. So I find lots of direct influences, even sometimes where you can tell when he writes some of his words that he's really pulling, not alluding to, but he's really pulling from Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or something like this. Um, even I even found some inspiration in here that I would I would be so 
I, I would definitely bet that it might have come from Andrzej Sapkowski's uh, like Witcher series, the books. Anyway, I'm obsessed. I love it. It's dark. It's heavy. It's sometimes hard to read because it's dark and heavy. There are children in this. And if you're sensitive to anything where children are um, harmed, it can be hard. And I am incredibly sensitive to that. Now, it's not senseless violence. It's nothing like that. There's there's enough in this book that is fantastical about these children that allow you to kind of keep it at an arm's length that doesn't like hit as hard as it would if it were just like something about senseless violence against children. It, that, that I couldn't read a book like that, I don't think. Um, and it's not, it's not pervasive or, you know, very prevalent in the story, but it's there. So, I mean, those kinds of things for some can be hard. It is engrossing and fa fantastic and I love it. And the next one in the series comes out in September and I'm so excited. So if you want something new to read on the fantasy side with a Victorian vibe and you like the idea of something that kind of is like a Harry Potter or a Lord of the Rings, but much darker, much murkier, much less, you know, juvenile friendly, this is such such a good one. It's going to be a lore that I think is going to be around for quite some time. So I'm really excited about this. I am, I mean, here's my progress. You can see where I am. Look at that. Almost done. And it's great. It's 658 pages. Woohoo! Look at me. Okay, so there's that. I also have been wanting, my husband um, picked up a book first before I go into the next one. My husband picked up a book for me for my birthday. And this is paperback by C.S. Harris called What Angels Fear. Now, I don't know if you've read this series of books. This is a whole series of books. I want to say, how many are in this series? My kids are out there doing something. Okay, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve books in this series, and this is the first one. And I can't wait. It's it's right down my alley. It's a Georgian time period in England. It's a murder mystery with, you know, a troubled, like, kind of maybe detective character. It's, um, it's right, the thread of, okay, it's 1811, the thread of revolution haunts the upper classes of King George III's England. Then the body of a beautiful young woman is found savagely murdered on the altar steps of an ancient church near Westminster Abbey. A dueling pistol discovered at the scene and the damning testimony of a witness both point to one man, Sebastian St. Cyr, Viscount Devlin, a brilliant young nobleman shattered by his experiences in the Neap Napoleonic Wars. Now a fugitive running for his life, Sebastian calls upon his skill as an officer during the war to catch the killer and prove his own innocence. In the process, he accumulates a band of unlikely allies, including the enigmatic beauty Kat Polin, who broke Sebastian's heart years ago. Love that. In Sebastian's world of intrigue and espionage, nothing is as it seems, yet the truth may hold the key to the future of the British monarchy, as well as to Sebastian's own salvation. And then he, Sebastian, is the character that carries through the entire series. Okay, love that. Super excited to read that. This next one is new. And you may already be familiar with this author. I am not. Um, this is the first I've seen of this person, but apparently she's amazing. And this is a book by Lee Bardugo called The Familiar. And I just picked this up at Target today um, because we were there getting some stuff and it was a 30% off the list price and I had a gift card for my birthday. So I picked this up and by golly, it sounds fantastic. And before you even, and I know they don't say don't judge a book by its cover, but before you even break into this, like, just look at how this book looks. Look at this gorgeous cover art. Look at the pages, matte black pages. Okay, but that's not even the best part. Hold on. Look at the lining. Oh my goodness. It's so good. It's beautiful. That's the author. You guys. On our way home from Target, I actually started reading this and I can tell I'm going to love it. It says, in a shabby house on a shabby street in the new capital of Madrid, Lucia Cotado uses scraps of magic to get through her days of endless toil as a scullion. But when her scheming mistress discovers that the lump of a servant cowering in the kitchen is actually hiding a talent for little miracles, she demands Lucia use those gifts to better the family's social position. What begins as simple amusement for the nobility takes a perilous turn when Lucia garners the notice of Antonio Perez, the disgraced 
Christ, secretary to Spain's king. Still reeling from the defeat of his armada, the king is desperate for any advantage in the war against England's heretic queen, and Perez will stop at nothing to regain the king's favor. Determined to seize this one chance to better her fortunes, Lucia plunges into a world of seers and alchemists, holy men and hucksters, where the lines between magic, science, and fraud are never certain. But as her journey, but as her notoriety grows, so does the danger that her Jewish blood will doom her to the Inquisition's wrath. She will have to use every bit of her wit and will to survive, and even if this means enlisting the help of Guillaume Santangel, I... I probably Santangel Santangel. I don't know. An embittered immortal familiar whose own secrets could prove deadly for them both. Like hello. It sounds so good. And so I started reading it. My goodness, this woman writes long sentences, but the cadence of the sentences are beautiful and it's very much in the like way that I enjoy reading and also the way that I write. I kind of write a lot of like parenthetical statements and long sentences and all of this. And I love that. So I'm really excited about getting into reading again, blocking out time in my day for it, prioritizing it. And I can see myself just really, I can see myself really becoming a pro prolific reader in no time. Not to mention that I'm listening to the audiobook from Moby Dick and I'm crazy about it. Who would have thought it? But it's a fantastic story, especially a fantastic story to have read to you. I don't know if I could wade through Moby Dick on my own if I were reading it, but listening to it is fabulous. So look at me, you guys, what is even happening, right? It's fantastic. And these books smell good. I can smell them. They smell good. Okay. The last thing I wanted to leave you with, if you're still here, I hope you are. The last thing I wanted to leave you with is a hand cream recommendation. I'm not sponsored by any of this. Okay. But somebody did ask, and I do happen to have a favorite hand cream for when I'm knitting one that I reach for all the time because it, it's really good for your hands and it doesn't leave them feeling greasy. Um, sticker shock warning. It's a little expensive, but it's a very high quality. Okay. You pay for quality, but I really do love it. This is by Kiehl's. I always say Kiehl's, but I feel like now that I'm saying it out loud, maybe it's Kyle's. I don't know, but here it is. This stuff is fantastic. It is ultimate strength hand salve all day care for severely dry active hands. It has um, avocado, eucalyptus, and sesame seed, natural wax derived from olive oil. Uh, let's see. It doesn't have any harsh chemicals or anything like that. Um, there was something else that I saw in here. Yeah, it's just, it says formulated for intensely dry, highly active hands. This heavy duty moisture treatment is a thick, rich formula offering all day care and protection to hands. Our blend of select ingredients allows skin to actually draw and absorb water from the air, forming a glove like protective barrier against moisture loss. I love this. And the reason I use such a strong hand salve like this, and, and trust me, it doesn't go on like a hand salve. It goes on um, like a hand cream. You can kind of see it there is because of my work. So dyeing yarn dries out your hands like nobody's business. And I wear heavy duty dishwashing gloves when I do it for that reason. And I even Vaseline my hands before putting them into the gloves to give them a little bit extra moisturization. But when I'm all done, it never fails. They just kind of feel dry. And this I'm telling you, it goes on and then it's in and it doesn't feel like, I don't know if you can tell by looking at my hand. Yeah, probably not. It's not greasy. There's no slimy feeling. There's no shiny texture. It's just in the skin. And then I could pick up my knitting and it doesn't have that weird feeling that's kind of repulsive when you have hand cream on and you're touching wool. It's honestly, it's the best. I will link to it down below. Um, there's lots of different places that you can get it. You can get it on Amazon as well. It is a little bit pricey, but a little bit goes a long way. What I showed you just now is probably even more than you would need. Um, and I've had this for a while and it goes a long way. So that's my recommendation for that. This has been lovely. Thank you for letting me sit here and talk about lots of things unrelated to knitting, especially books. What are you reading right now? Can we do that? on this knitting podcast, knitting slash bookcast. What are you reading right now? My favorite genres are historical fiction. Fantasy slash historical fiction is great. I'm not one to read pure romance novels. That's just not really my thing. But if it has some historical element to it or some kind of fantastical element to it, I'm into it. Um, but really, I'm kind of trying to branch out. So let me know what you're reading. You can find me on Goodreads if you're on Goodreads. I'm on there. Um, yeah, 
But this has been good. Thank you so much for spending your time with me and taking the time to listen to me gab about all of this. I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your weekend. I hope that your knitting projects or whatever projects you're working on are going smoothly. And to those of you that are over on Patreon as part of the KT Cal, you guys are doing fantastic. Thank you for being a part of it. And thank you to everybody who supports the channel over on Patreon. It means a lot. If you guys enjoyed yourself or took value from today's video, please don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. Definitely subscribe and click the bell icon so you can be notified anytime I upload new content here on the channel, which is every Wednesday and every Sunday. And until I see you again for Wednesday's episode of the Midweek Ramble, happy knitting, happy making, happy whatever it is that you're doing. Take care, be well, and I will see you soon. Bye.